Viewers like you make this program possible. Support your local PBS station. In this episode, Chef Sean Brock samples just a little of the magic that is Louisiana. Chef Donald Link takes Sean to the swamps looking for bullfrogs. I feel like we're hunting a frog. <laughs> Makes frog legs and grits with sauce pecan. Sean cooks an African gumbo. <laughs> Cooks his version of shaved catfish with Chef John Currens. I don't think they're going to take your beard metal back, but. <laughs> and joins John T. Edge at the legendary Middendorf's where the shaved catfish was invented. You don't understand it until you taste it here. <laughs> Enter the mind of a chef. God, I love cooking food. It's the coolest thing. Man, that's good. <laughs> Louisiana should really be its own country. I mean, right now, Louisiana has, has my full attention. It's an extremely vast and diverse area when you're speaking of music and culture and food. And not only are there so many different aspects of all those things, all of them only exist there. Southerners look at Louisiana as its own little world. It's just so different, such a different way of life than anywhere else in the South. What's so intriguing and interesting about that is, is, is it the swamp? Is it the history? You know, what is it? You can go anywhere in Louisiana and have completely different experiences. Everyone that I've ever met from Louisiana has just been the coolest, most country, most fun to be around, enjoying life type of person. Donald Link, to me, in my opinion, is like the undisputed world heavyweight champion of Cajun cuisine and Cajun cooking. He's the guy that, if I have a question about Cajun cooking, Donald's the guy I go to. Hey, Sean, you ready? Hell yeah. What are the odds of getting struck by lightning? Oh, I think it is getting closer. Yes. So if you grow up in Louisiana, you hunt for your food. It's one of the funnier hunts that you can go on is frog gigging or, or going to catch frogs. Everybody good? Yeah, let's make it happen. Do it. He ain't scared, is he? No, nah, man, he's just sitting there. He don't give a Frogging in the bayou is a whole different ball game. Like when I was a kid catching frogs, I didn't have to dodge alligators. Lotus flowers. Wow. Pretty cool, huh? Look at that one. You can eat those. No way. So what you do is you're cruising around, you do the banks like this, uh -huh. you'll see their eyes. And that's what you're looking for. So when you're looking around, if they're on the banks, their eyes should shine. I mean, you can look down in the water and every now and then you'll see one swimming. But those are fun catches, so if you can find one swimming, you can grab your hand down there and snatch it. Just say, oh no, that sound is not the frog we're looking for. What you're looking for is this deep, like, manly frog groan. <laughs> My mom has this really strange fear of frogs, so that's all I did as a kid was catch them and chase her with them. One time I thought it'd be funny to put one in the fridge so it would jump out at her when she opened the fridge, and it just died. She got mad as hell, I had to throw all the food away. I heard one. The elusive bullfrog. So I feel like we're hunting a frog. <laughs> <laughs> like somewhere there's one frog in this swamp. I hear him. Oh, oh. There it comes. Oh. Is that the sound of rain? Yep. I think we should turn around. I think we're about to get dumped on. Yeah, that's serious, man. I think we're we're within five minutes of rain. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah we need to get out of here. There it comes. <laughs> <laughs> That's no joke, man. That came in quick. <laughs> Got it. Let's go. Let's wrap it. It's all a wrap. There you go. <laughs> At least I can say I caught a frog tonight. <laughs> I spotted it. <laughs> and I remember as a kid, like, my mom would always cook frog legs. And 
to me, it was like this adventurous thing to eat. And like for, for me sitting there eating frogs, like you get cool points. It's like I'm eating a frog, you know, I'm eating something that I've been chasing around all day and grabbing. <laughs> We're here at the Dakota Williams house in Abbeville, Louisiana, and um, we attempted to do a little <laughs> frog hunting yesterday. I think it was the first day in the history of Louisiana <laughs> where there was no bullfrogs in sight. A little rough last <laughs> night. We're gonna make a really cool dish with these crazy, enormous, wonderful bullfrogs. Yeah, luckily somebody went out and caught some. <laughs> this is a pretty classic Cajun dish. I think sauce piquant and etouffee are probably what you see the most of out here. So I've got a bunch of different peppers here. This is the hard part of cooking with chilies for me, but you could really ruin a dish if the chilies are really hot. Like some people see a recipe, it's like two jalapenos, and they'll put two jalapenos in there, but they're not tasting the jalapenos. Yeah, to they, see if they, they're they could be raging. completely bland, or they could be ripping hot. Wow, mm, good. See, that's not yeah, too hot. This whole it's thing. good. This is our Cajun spice that we use at the restaurants. But the idea of, of this spice mix is not really to make the food spicy, but to give it that that snap and a little bit of heat. And to me, that's what these fresh chilies do, is that you can really impart a chili flavor without burning your mouth up. Funny when you ask people what is Cajun food, and you'd be surprised how many people don't really know the difference between Creole and Cajun. What do you think the difference My is? opinion is Creole is a more refined with a little more French influence, more of a city, downtown sort of thing in a finer restaurant, and uh, Cajun being a little more rural and, and country. I'd say that's accurate. And it's just, it's really from the land. The, the real gist of it is that they're raising their own food and they're growing their own vegetables. And I think that's the true spirit of true Cajun cooking. So you rarely see them whole like this when you buy them from a Yeah, when you get them from purveyor. a purveyor, they're usually cut. The bright side of not catching frogs last night is we got to skip the whole bloody mess of frog cleaning. <laughs> The meat is so clean. Yeah. I just really love the flavor of it. It's like, you know, you could say frogs taste like chicken, but they don't. They taste oh, like frogs. Oh, nothing like it. Yeah. Some of my earliest memories of food were eating frog, and just being a kid and always catching them and, you know, chasing them around, scaring people with them. It was just so cool to eat something that someone was terrified of. It's a good catch right there. <laughs> we really did catch all these yesterday. We just, the cameras, they couldn't get the battery working or something. Something about the audio. <laughs> By the time the cameras got on, we were all, you know, couldn't catch anything after that. All right, it's fry time. Fry time. You could just make a roux and then throw the vegetables in and, and do it like that, but... You're gonna get so much more depth yeah, in flavor. Yeah, I, I like searing it first because it almost makes a fond in the bottom yeah. of the pot. Sometimes it kick. <laughs> Whoa. Looking good, man. Look at this. Good. That's some good focus there, Tom. <laughs> How does it feel to be cooking something? Love it, man. <laughs> cooking is why I got into this in the first place. Dude, what is better than drinking beer and cooking frog legs? <laughs> Nothing. It's the best. It's going to be good. Let's see. How did these come out? We got any cooked? Oh, yeah. There's a couple that are falling apart. These, we're not even going to make some sauce piquant today because we're going to eat all the frog legs right now. <laughs> Once you taste something like that, that's what motivates you to get out there for seven hours and hunt those things down. <laughs> yeah, let's go back tonight. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, <a new> spot. <laughs> all right, so we're going to use a spatula. Uh, this is definitely... That's, that's the good stuff. stuff. Oh, yeah. What we want to get off. I can't for the life of me bring myself to ever measure this out. Yeah. Because it's just basically what I'm looking for. It's a feeling. I think it's two handfuls for this. <laughs> Trust me, nobody follows a recipe for this. Yeah. It's everyone's personal touch and personal character and soul that personal goes into taste. the dish. See, what I'm smelling for right now is that brew. I can it I just can turn. smell it. Yeah, yeah it, it just, just got turned. hot. So I would go ahead and say we'll just go for it now. This is one of my absolute favorite smells in the world right oh, here. Man. When those vegetables hit that roux, yeah! We're gonna throw the chilies in too. All right. This looks so good. I know, it's so good like that. I think just a little bit for uh, acid. And see, that's what's cool about cooking is like, you just go with whatever feels right. You know, like you look at it and you, you, you make a change. It's like. Well, this is to me, it's like we've got a nice roux, we've got a nice fond. I think we're. Smelling perfect. See, I'm just changing the direction from more of a yep. sauce piquant to a little more of a smothered frog leg. Uh huh, yep. This is the frog stock we made off camera. Mm hmm. 
Now this needs to simmer a while. Two reasons. One, we need to get some of the oil to come up. Uh-huh. But just to let all the flavors marry and to cook that the flour taste out. Mm-hmm. In the meantime. In the meantime, we'll eat everything that's supposed to go in here. I always try to aim for this sauce to be thinner than the finished product, because when you put all the floured, pre-seared meat back in it, it, it adds that thickener yeah. to it. Yeah, this is delicious. <laughs> I think we're ready to eat this, man. Look at that. Yeah, notice how it's changed. It's like completely different now. So we're gonna eat it with grits today, which is kind of, a, I guess, maybe a sin here. I, I wouldn't serve it with grits here. No, you might get this in is deep obviously deep we're, trouble. We're in the heart of rice country. Yeah. Yeah. For me, this is like a cool sort of mashup of shrimp and grits. And in Charleston, we, we use grits and rice kind of interchangeably. And these grits are some of the best I've ever had. It's what you call a nap on a plate right there. Yep, <laughs> it is. This will put you down. That's what happens when I, I come to Louisiana. <laughs> Gravy and grits. Sounds like a James Brown song, doesn't it? <laughs> All right, so there we have the frog sauce piquant. Not much better than that. Good job, man. Likewise. <laughs> <laughs>
Let's grab some rice. Traditionally served with some beautiful whole grain rice. Oh, that fantastic stuff goes in there. Some of that broth. That's exactly how it would be served with it. Each person gets a little piece of eggplant. So what's really cool is you take what we know gumbo to be. It looks just like that. Yeah. But what's fascinating to me is the journey that it takes and how it changes from this, what we just cooked, but to follow its journey and to watch how each individual culture changes it just a tiny bit. What I love about it is it, it's still gumbo. Yeah. It's still that color, that flavor. It's the same emotion that you experience when you eat it in West Africa and you eat it in New Orleans. Mm. So good. That's hangover food is what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me the history of this place, so 1930s. 1934. So it was Lewis and Josie um, Middendorf who opened it. He was the bartender, and he ran back and forth to New Orleans to buy beer and she was the cook. And they started at like, the height of the Depression, right after Prohibition um, had been eased. And almost from the beginning, she was shaving the catfish. You know, you'd get a lot of servings out of one cat, too. What's cool is like, you know, we snuck back in the kitchen and it's just controlled chaos back there. I love yeah. that. You know, there were like multiple generations of the same family, you know, working the line, slicing catfish. And it, uh, there's a lot of sustaining employees that have made this place work. I mean, this is definitely um, a, a, an epitome of what I think a New Orleans restaurant is, even though this is 40 miles away. Damn, I thought that was us. <laughs> I feel like catfish is something that you see all over the South, everywhere, all the time. It's like, it's like the constant. It's like the constant variable. It's always there. It's in the finest restaurants, and it's in a fish camp. You know, like, it, it's, it, it's all the above. And I think that's what's cool about it. A lot of people don't like catfish because they've only had bad, bad farm-raised catfish. When we opened Husk, we, we vowed us, like, all right, we're gonna keep catfish on the menu in some form, like every day. And you think about that as almost like an educational mission? Like... That's why we did it. Yeah. We said it day one, like we want people to, to really fall in love with this because number one, it's, it's crazy delicious. And number two, farming fish the right way is the future of aquaculture. Perfect time. Yes. He had two thins. <laughs> he had thick. Ooh. Man, that is insane. Yeah. It's just beautiful. <laughs> it's like the whole side of the fish. So, like, if you really think about it, this was this was born in the Depression yep. to make the most of what you had, and people fell in love with it. It also shows great technique. Like, you know, I mean, you sit down here and you realize when you bite into this fish that what sustained this place is the muscle memory of the ladies who know how to shave this fish. Like, 3,500 people eating here. It's a thousand pounds of catfish a day. <laughs> It's cool, too, because it's not some temple of gastronomy. It's just like it's everybody's food. You know, there are many people who dismiss the South, and there are many people who even more so dismiss the foods of kind of the working class South. And I think catfish is, is kind of represents that for people. Exactly. It does. It's a symbol, you know? It's, right. well, it's a symbol for us in a positive way. I think it's for some people a symbol of our South in a negative way. Yeah. And until you taste it here, yeah. All the stuff that's happening out in the other states where people are interpreting Louisiana foods, you don't understand it until you taste it here. The catfish, I think, is just, it is the South embodied in one bite of food. Thin fried catfish. Middendorf style. Which is a super cool thing that you really only see at that restaurant. And their thing is taking this catfish and slicing it paper thin. I love that idea because it's like more breading. Right. You know? And it's super, super simple. Uh, they use cornmeal, right? Right. You want to attempt this or you want me to? I want you to, uh, chef. These ladies in their cut room, you know, can go through those fillets front, front handed, back handed. They'll, they'll take, you know, two or three fillets out of a side. And it's cool that the, it's so popular that they've just continued to build it to where now I think it seats about maybe 700 people. I could be wrong. Are you but, kidding me? Yeah, you know, it's massive. Not bad. 
Oh, you're getting cocky now, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna cut my hand off. <laughs> you know what I like about catfish is it's mostly farm raised when you get in a restaurant. I think that's like so important for us to embrace. Yeah. Because we've overfished the waters. Yeah. Catfish has a reputation for being a little bit muddy. You know, it's it's sort of it's the pedestrian seafood, or it's not really given credit. You know, for being as good as it is. You think they use tweezers at Mentor? <laughs> We would not get a job there, I don't think. Oh, I would not make it long there. One of the um, cool things about this is, you know, we're taking something classic and, and beautiful and something that's been done so well for so long. And, you know, when you get it into your kitchen, you adapt it, you know, like we're using this beautiful catfish. We're using Cruz Family Buttermilk. We're using Anson Mills cornmeal from Heirloom Corn. You smell that, it smells like you're in the field, you know, because that's the way food used to taste. It all used to be heirloom, you know? It all used to be fantastic. That's the great thing about what's happening with, with food now, is that from the beginning of careers with guys in the kitchen that are serious about food now, you know, you're learning as much of the history of food. You're learning about the importance of why we've got to get away from, from GMO. You're learning about you know, agriculture, you know? Yeah. Like, it used to be the role of a chef was very, very simple. You just made food taste good, you know? Now people are becoming more and more educated yeah. about our food system and, and Therefore, they have more questions, and they look to us for the, for the answers, you know? No, it's not mid doors, but... Whatever. I don't think they're gonna take your beard metal back, but... <laughs> <laughs> so what do you like to serve it with? For me, hot sauce and lemon. That's the way I like it. And you gotta have some tartar sauce, too. It's not, it's not, it's not perfect, but... You're the Grand Ackett's of <laughs> fried catfish. <laughs> awesome. Beautiful. Doesn't get much better than that. Give that to me right now. <laughs> Make it rain hot sauce. <laughs> Take two, mind of a fry cook. <laughs> I love going to Louisiana. I love going to New Orleans, and I'm just now starting to explore the rest of Louisiana. When you get off the plane and you land in Louisiana and you put your feet on that soil, you just feel like you're in this really special place. It's one of the last sort of unchanged and untouched regions of the South and, and in fact, the entire United States. And you walk away realizing what a special place Louisiana is. There's no other place like Louisiana. I could live there, no problem. I mean, that, that's kind of my pace. Thank you.